Ora. Tina koe te warehi, Janet, me te omokopuna Justice, koutou e kawe a tonu tia ngā ohaki o mātou tipuna, a tēnā koutou katoa. I tēnei wā, me huri ngā whakaaro kia rātou mā ko wehe atu, ko te kui a Justice i wehe atu i tēnei wiki. Nā te wai tātou i tuku mai, mā te wai anō rātou e whakahuki atu, ki tai whetu ki o te pō, tāu ki atu ai, moe mai, moe mai, moe mai rā, e kui, rātou kia rātou, tātou kia tātou, nō reira tēnā tātou katoa. E kore ngā mutu, e kore rā e mutu ngā mihi kia kautou, i mō te hāpai i tō tātou kaupapa nei e haere ake, Te wārehi nāu i whakaingoa tia te kaupapa nei te hohau te rongo. He kaupapa o te kure raumati o te whakapono pahai o Aotearoa. Nō reira, tēnā tātou katoa. Kia ora, Wallace. O te wārehi, as you are known now, Janet, I just wanted to give a very warm welcome on behalf of the National Spiritual Assembly and the Baha'is of Aotearoa to you and thank you so much for agreeing to share uh, some of your thoughts about the Māori historical and contemporary perspectives on impacts of colonisation here in the beautiful Hihiaua Cultural Centre in Whangarei with all of us, the Baha'i community of Aotearoa and Summer School 2021. Both of you are very well known and well respected Baha'is um, you've served with distinction over the years. We know how very busy you've been in the last few years serving mm. your hapu and your iwi. And, uh, and yeah, I'm just very, very grateful that uh, you've made this time for us. And uh, so happy to see you all again. Kia ora. Mm. And uh, I just wanted to mention before we start that whakatauki, ko te kai a te rangatira he kōrero. <laughs> the sustenance of chief's uh, oratory or words. And uh, I think that's what we're here for today, uh, to hear from you and uh, your perspectives. So again, thank you. Uh, we'll launch into the questions very shortly. Kia ora. Thank you for, for that. Okay. Um, te warehi, we thought we'd start with you. Nō hea koe, nā wai koe. Can you tell me a little bit about your background, where you're from, your early life? Uh, perhaps something about you know how you found the Baha'i faith as well because I think that's always a very pivotal uh, point in time for many of us who, who have become Baha'is over the years and also something about uh, that early life that formed the basis of your work for today if you can share some of your whakaro about that Nō reira tēnā koe O pēhā te roa te o te aho Kei a koe tēnā. Kei a koe tēnā. Engari, ka te tuatahi ni atu tēnei ki a koe e huti. Tō mi mai wha ki a māua ne. E tino hona rei tēnei ki a māua ki te noho. Te tōtaha. E te whiriwhiri hoki ngā kōrero o nga taunga. Ae, ka haere tunu hoki te mahi o a tātou nei tūpuna. A ko tātou tēnā, ko tātou katoa e kaue e hoki tō rātou nei a wanga wanga ki runga hoki te papani. Reira kanui hoki te mihi kia koe. So I was, yeah, I was wondering how long is a, how long is a piece of string. To briefly talk about um, the past, I guess I can start by the fact that I was born here in Whangare, although I was raised <coughs> amongst our people out at um, Whangaruru, which is about 30 miles north. Gee, I'm still thinking in miles. 30 miles north of Whangare on the coast road to Russell. Coast road? Paradise? <laughs> um, and the centre of the universe. I know you've claimed Ngāti Pro is the centre of the universe. <laughs> but, um, so I was raised there. Um, and interesting thing too, you know, because back in the 50s and the 60s, um, the, 
the elders of that time, were, most of them were born, most of them were born in the 1800s. So they, they were really close to that period that we, you know, we, we still talk about today. <coughs> and it's also a gentle reminder for me is that that's how close we were to the Stone Age times of our ancestors. Interesting for there. Yes, very interesting. <laughs> the connection's still there. Yeah, but the connection, because it's so close though, the connection is still re really strong in the minds of a lot of us. Although the new generation that's coming through, and, and the period, that period too, during the 50s, 60s, well before they the 40s, because we come through the war as well, eh? uh, the Great World War. But during that period, we, we saw changes then. It was quite, we never had power at home, for example. And um, uh, we were raised on a farm. Where dad, who wasn't a trained farmer like the, the farmers of today, uh, 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 you almost had to have a university degree, university degree to milk a cow. Um, so it was, you know, it was a very stressful time for them. And uh, there were hard times for us as well. Um, because the stress that was on our parents to try and cover the costs that was put on them by the government in regards to um, materials they needed to, to um, uh, run a farm. So they found themselves forever trying to catch up to paying, paying the bills. And many of them had to leave and head off to um, the cities to find a job to keep, uh, keep afloat. So that's a brief enough look at that period, I think. That um, was the urban drift. That was the urban drift, yes. Left and, the rural yeah. areas and went to the cities to work. Yeah, mm. and that's the time that, that, that's the period that that happened. Um, and with that, I think we, that, and it's, it's that period too, that we um, see the division or the breakdown from our, our culture. In that period, we were already were losing the leo. In fact, we all well, we, we weren't allowed to speak the leo at school until the end of '50, when the headmaster said that we could speak the language. But it was too late. The, you know, the damage was done. That was about '59 when he made that statement. <coughs> so, with um, the disappearance of the leo, or the gradual disappearance of the of the leo. Um, that urban drift separated our people from the tikanga that, um, uh, that was practiced over those things, uh, over the environment. Because, I, 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 you know, for me personally, growing up at that period, um, we could go and catch as many fish as we like, although we had our own rules in regards to fishing. Um, uh, also, we, the ngahere was still there. I was raised eating kiwi and kuku, kukupa, weka. I was raised eating that food because it was 1957, I think it was, when the, the law changed. Um, and it changed because, you know, uh, those those resources started to disappear. The kiwi started to disappear because of the destruction I should say, the deforestation of our ngahere um, was coming to an end. Um, so yeah, so those, those are the sort of changes that we, we began to um, witness. And once you lose contact with, with your environment, you lose contact to, that, to who you are as a, as a as a person, as a people. Um, 
Yeah, and we took on <laughs> living like our 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 park, our host. Yeah. You mentioned that you were sent away to study carving by your elders. Yeah. Yeah, 19, <coughs> in 1835, during the, during the um, well, 1835 was when they gathered at Tauranga Tiro in Waitangi. Yeah. And we know to the, the Te Whakaputanga in the north here, yeah? He Whakaputanga. <coughs> and that was the, the, the what we refer to also as the Declaration of Independence of the United Tribes of, of Aotearoa. And it was there that all the chiefs gathered and they discussed the future. They laid down guidance for, the, for, the, for our future. And one of those uh, statements, especially in the North here, was the abolishment of carved meeting houses. And um, that took place, and it was mainly because, and this was a decision made by our elders, because at that time as well, during Whakaputanga, um, the decision was made to accept Christianity for the first time. And they also stated that, because um, there was a bit of a tussle between the, the sects of Christianity, of uh, which one should be the, the one to rule, like whether it should be Mihenare, should it be Katurika. And now people say no, that all religions should be, should be acknowledged in this. So that was the decision, one of the decisions that were made too. So when they, they made the decision to abolish carved meeting houses in Taitokoro, this is when we started to, to see um, the appearance of halls springing up all over the place in, in, in Northland here. And of course, you know, with, with, with halls, there was, a, there was a, uh, I think there was a room that you, you couldn't hold, hold your, your funerals in the hall. But of course, our people ignored that, <laughs> and still, and, and and still had our tangi in, in halls and stuff like that. So a lot of the the marae we see around, say Fangarudu, for example, even here in Fa, Fangarudu, have all started off as halls, but now they've gradually, over time, have gradually reverted back to um, to being called marae, to marae and farinui. So that happened in 1835, that sprung up. And about the 40s, of course, um, Ngata. Api Dhamma Api, yeah, Api Dhamma Ngata. I, I, I refer to that, to, to that period um, uh, as, as part of Ngata's crusade for the restoration of our, of our culture. So it's pretty much started back from that period. Um, you know, we made that statement. <coughs> uh, and so, and he, he, he gathered together a collection of uh, artisans, I think would be the word. Uh, they used then of um, carvers and weavers and traveled the country rebuilding meeting houses. So they came north, uh, settled at Mototau because there, you know, they had Tau Henare who was a, a fellow parliamentarian of Api. So the, uh, the house was built in the house at uh, Waitangi, the Whare Runanga, we refer to as the Whare Runanga, was initially built so that 
visitors coming to Aotearoa or New Zealand or tourists coming to Aotearoa could see what a meeting house used to look like. Right? And, and that's the reason why that one was built. So that basically was the first one, uh, first Whareni to be re to that came into existence after the abolishment of card meeting house in Taitukera. Now, uh, while they were the Tohunga that came north and headed the 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 the, the Wananga or the, the 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 group of carvers or trainee carvers. <coughs> Ooh, came from uh, Teteko in the Bay of, Bay of Plenty. His name was Edomiha Kapua. And he, he headed that school of carvers. Amongst, the, amongst that group of carvers, of course, was Pine Tayapa, Hone Tayapa, Charlie Tua, uh, Taurua, Tuarua, Taurua from um, Taurua, sorry, from uh, uh, Rarotonga. Uh, Hori Waititi. There's, yeah, there's a few others as well. But they came north to, to carve this, uh, the meeting house here. They've also travelled elsewhere throughout the country as well. But while they were building that meeting, that whare runanga at Waitangi, um, Ngāpui had invited Edamia to travel to Mangamuka to carve the meeting house there. And uh, the school then was taken over by Pine Tayapa. <laughs> From Tiki Tiki. <laughs> and, and they completed it. So in the meantime, Ira Miha Kapua traveled to Mangamuka. And that house then became the first meeting, functional meeting house to be built in, in Ngāpui or Taitokera since the abolishment of car meeting houses. Enemia oh. then came back to uh, Motatau and then started the carvings for Tiri Amarai at Tuma, Tuma Tawenga uh, in memory of um, our soldiers who, who, um, who um, attended the First and Second World War and named that one Tuma and it was during that period that Eramia um, Kapua passed away, and it was uh, one of his students, uh, Hori Waititi, who completed. Hori Waititi, of course, was from Whanauapunui, and he completed uh, that whare, and it was opened in um, 1963. And it was that period that our, during that period, was our, our people realised that when they abolished card meeting houses in Taitukero, uh, they threw the baby out with the bath water. And it was then that uh, the tribes of New Zealand chose... It was then that I was chosen to represent all the tribes of Taitukera to go to Rotorua to train under Hone Taiapa to learn the skill of Whakairo. And after that time here, I returned home uh, in Hone Taiba's word, you're now, uh, my, my training of you has completed. It's now time for you to go home to your people to study the deeper meaning of Whakaido and the history that's connected to it. Mm. Beautiful connection from right from 1835 and yeah. then prior to that with all the destruction of the meeting houses in that time to, yeah. to now and your role in bringing that, restoring yeah. and reclaiming that back for your people. Yeah. Kia ora. So from what, that, yeah, and, 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 and from that, that study that I, you know, I mean attending the Wananga back here in Taitokero too is when, you, when, um, when I realised that Whakaido wasn't just Whakaido. Whakairo was about community building. It was all about community building and the well-being of the community. Because when you're, when you're working with Whakairo, that's one of the, the aspects of our culture 
that tapped into all aspects of our environment, whether it's from the sea mm. and the land and the air. The wairua. Mm. And of course, most importantly, the wairua. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah, so, so, I, I, so I initially thought then that um, uh, the job, the task that I had was, was given was to um, um, travel through the north and, and just carve meeting houses. But it wasn't until I was called over to, um, to the Bay of Islands <coughs> and um, Hudi uh, Waititi was there. He, he, he was one of the elders that, that spoke, although he was from Whana Hapuni. Uh, Himi Henare, who wasn't knighted at that stage, uh, Rani Era Fiu, and other kaumatua from throughout Taitokara were there to uh, basically begin um, begin my training. They even they even um, it was them that said. Um, you're going to be working, yeah, we've got a job for you here. You're going to be teaching up at Bay of Islands College. Of course, I freaked out. <laughs> uh, I didn't go through a teacher's training college or anything like that, but they stuck me in there. Um, Not much older than the kids. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, so I, um, I was in my, you know, I was about 22, 23. Uh, so that, yeah, so I was, I, was, yeah, I was way out of my, my depth, I think, going there. But I think what kept me grounded was, um, you know, going back to the Otiria or going back to the Otiria and, and touching base with those Kaumatua. <coughs> so up until that point, I, th I thought, oh, yeah, I'm going to be busy traveling around north and carving. But that wasn't the case at all. It was then that I, I, I started learning about Whakaputanga and all of that sort of, you know, all of that history uh, connected to Whakaputanga. Well, even further back to the Kite Tainga Maya Cook, the first, his first content, all of that information prior to that. Um, but a big part of it too was learning of the existence of the carvers that, that were the old tohunga uh, of Northland. That exists. I didn't realize that uh, I thought I was going to be, I was the only cover that existed coming up. See how naive I was. And then, of uh, course, Hone Taipa refused to teach us That's that history of Fakairo in, in Taitokero. So it wasn't until I come back and I said, oh, yeah, we did have carvers. In fact, my name, Te Wari Hikokowai, I was named after um, uh, a carver, but he was also um, uh, another part of his mahi was um, what they referred to as um, the hahu, the hahu koiwi. So that was the, the, the practice, practice of burial, part of the practice of burial that our our people um, practiced back in the day when someone passed away. Uh, we he. Um, buried them in shallow graves. And after a year, year and a half, maybe, they dug them up, cleaned the bones off, and then entered them into um, the caves or, or torere. And that was uh, the role that uh, uh, Te Warehi Kokowai carried. And of Kokowai, he was also an expert in, that, uh, in the art of uh, creating Kokowai or the paint. And there are many colours, different colours that he uh, uh, was able to use. So there we had that contact with the environment there. Back to Papa Tuanuku and the oil that was used to make the paint came from uh, Tangoroa or from the, the ate of the shark. Yeah. Or the, the hindu from the, the blubber of the whale when it happened to wash up on the shore. Yeah. So there, there was the Wari Koko, and then there was a whole list of other carvers too. That was it was a it was a privilege for me to to learn about. 
Um, and it was in that period when I, I, I started to realize is that the reason I was sent away was to prepare me for the re-establishment of our identity as Māori, and the reclamation of our identity. Because um, out of all of my siblings, I was the only one that was kept away from uh, becoming a staunch Christian. And my studies were all in regards to Atua Māori from that point onwards. Yeah. Um, just just a, a, a little little story that happened during this, you know, the early 70s when I, when I shared this with you earlier. And it was, a, a, I think, was part of the test that I personally had to, had to traverse through. Uh, so in around 1974, 75, uh, I was invited to start a, a carving course at a wood at a woodwork um, session down here at uh, Fangare Intermediate and uh, the woodwork teacher was a fellow from Australia and uh, I was already teaching at Bay College of course so he started that course off then he called me about a couple of weeks later and said um, that one of the parents didn't want his son involved with the carbine program. So I, I advise him that, you know, we, we, we're not here to, to force people to do carving. If they don't want to do it, then, yeah. then he said, uh, it's a little bit more to it. He's he wants the, the course abolished, stopped. He's gone to the headmaster, the headmaster, uh, the principal didn't agree with him, told him to go away. Then he, he, he uh, approached the PPTA back then, Parent Teachers Association, to stop the, the, the carving aspect of that woodworking, uh, woodwork program. And he never got any luck there, so he went to the papers and then to television and said that um, his argument for stopping it was that um, he felt that um, devil worship shouldn't be allowed to be taught in our schools. And this is what he applied to the carving, carving program that we'd introduced into the and oh, of course, as a young fellow, that caught me caught me completely off guard. And I was, you know, that 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 was a, a whole nother level again. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, I was, I was really grateful that all of the guns of Maori, them, Sir James Henry's, came out firing his guns. Uh, Ranginui Walker came out, and they were saying things like, you know, if if you're preventing our our culture from being taught in school, you should. You should get rid of uh, the Greek lessons that, that are taught to our kids. <laughs> yeah. so that's a type of argument that they put up against that statement. But what it did, did for, for, to me personally was to question our existence as Māori. And I thought the only way I could do that was to study the Bible from front to beginning, and I did that. Front to end. <laughs> front to beginning, <laughs> yeah, front to end. Front to back. Front to end, and even that statement right at the end of the Bible, you know, even that was very telling, where it says, you know, you shouldn't interpret what's said in the Bible, that sort of stuff, yeah, I found that really interesting. So I, I, I made it a point to study the Bible from the beginning, Genesis, all the way through, uh, to the to the end several times and I didn't I wanted to do it myself without being guided by uh, ministers or priests or those people who held the authority of how the how 
uh, you should study the Bible. I wanted to make my own mind up of, of what, what, what was, was being said in there. And so, yeah, so I did that. You know, I, I, the part that got me in the, in, in the stories, in, 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 you know, in the Old Testament, where they talk about how, how God punished sinners. And you know, there's a story of uh, uh, Gomorrah. They reckon it was one of the, the most sinful cities on planet Earth. And he wiped them out completely. That set me back in my, my seat and I started thinking. Now, if we Maori were considered practitioners of the devil, then surely we would not have arrived in this country. He would have stopped us when Maui Tiki Tiki Ataranga began the journey way back in Sabai. God had heaps of time to wipe our people out then. But we arrived here. So why did he let us do that? And that's when my, my, um, my thinking then started to turn to, um, and inadvertently that led me to the Baha'i faith. Um, along with the visions, of course, that I was receiving. <laughs> I won't go there. <laughs> but inadvertently that led me to, to the faith, because then I started uh, tracking down um, other religions as well. Then you can, then you start to see the similarities that happen. But interestingly enough, um, uh, you know Utidia, the Marae at Utidia. Very well. That that when we when I first moved there, so well, went over there uh, in 1970. 72, 73, the meeting house was pink. They was, they, <laughs> they had covered it with the undercoat because that pink had red lead in it, eh? And it made the, the, the wood last a lot longer. That's the way they preserved the timber back then. But the thing was, that, that Fare Nui was pink for a long time. So around about 76, uh, we had, I had started the carvings for uh, the canoe house out at Waitangi. Because in 1974, they bought Ngātoki Matafaurua, which was parked up by the Whareirūnanga. They brought it down to uh, Hobson's Bay, or the Mike, uh, down to Maikuku, and parked it there. So, so then we just, they just, the elders decided they better build a, a shelter for it to look after that waka. So we were carving that at Ōtiria. Right. Uh, now, at Ōtiria, the Māori had the marae, then you had this little shelter shed, and they called that Ngautuara. Mm. And then the dining room. <laughs> eh? So, um, and the reason for Ngautuara being there is that anything that was said in the meeting house that people disagreed with, they can go in there and backbite <laughs> all the decisions that were made inside the building. So we come in there Ngautuara to carve the meeting house out at um, I mean, not the meeting house, uh, the, the, canoe the, house. The, the canoe shelter out at Waitangi. And it was during that period when the Marae Committee got these people to come in to paint the building up. Or they, they had offered, these people came along and offered to paint the building. And they all, they all turned up. And I was saying to Edema, Edema, of course, is uh, you know, the son of Sir James Henry. Yeah. I said, well, who, who are these people? Because they just swarmed over it's everything, roof, it seemed. <laughs> and he said, oh, they're, um, what's his name? Uh, Martin Visser. They said, oh, they're, they're Martin Visser's uh, friends. Then, I, well, I didn't know who Martin Visser was then. And uh, I said, well, who is he? He said, oh, he's a Baha'i. I said, what the heck's a Baha'i? <laughs> so this was after all of them, after I had did that study on the, and he didn't know much about it, but, but that, the, that gathering affected me. Because they turned up, they, they, they were Rangi Māori people, and it's the first time I've seen a, a group of people that felt like us as Māori. Mm. Eh? 
So I was basing, I was judging them on feelings. <laughs> and you got that warm feeling from them. <laughs> so they came, finished without saying a word, or, and did it free of cost. The painting of the, the marae. Painting of the marae. Can I so community? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, so that was from the, yeah, that was amazing. So that, that sort of stuck in my mind, because then I was still, still, uh, so when the time came, then, and then of course Janet and I, um, we were helping the people at, um, at Whakapara, Ngati Ho, we had at Whakapara here, to um, rebuild again this community thing, building. To, to rebuild their marae there. So although I don't become involved hands-on with building the marae, it's building them up towards establishing the marae and the, and the culture that's connected to it. Yeah. yeah. And we were there when um, um, a friend of the marae, Pākehā Whala, was heading back to England. And uh, he's turned up to the marae there and um, said that, oh, he's got a whole lot of stuff for sale. And then he's going to head off to England. So we came into Whangarei, went through it, and in amongst his collection of stuff was a little book about the Baha'i faith. And it was that book that talked about progressive, first book I saw about progressive revelation. And I got that, and that's the one because the stars connected. That's the one that that really um, uh, led me towards studying the faith, finding out more about it. Mm. And um, and then, of course, it, 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 that coincided with the time that Rihanna turned up yes. at at Fangadudu. So, I was, and it was then that all the vision started to happen. And uh, not long after that, we met you. Yes. <laughs> And um, amazing, it's amazing. Oh, I think what, what, what uh, flabbergasted me was that we were, it's like I, I, was, I was saying earlier, that our, us, we are so close to the Stone Age period. Mm -hmm. At school, we think the Stone Age period goes way back, you go through those, uh, the, the, those periods, eh? you get to the iron, the, the, the copper, or the... Yep. and all the way to the Stone Age. But here we are so close to it. And to think that the founder of the faith, Baha'u'llah, arrived in that same period yes. that colonization started in Aotearoa. Yeah. Yeah. I still find that fascinating. Mm -hmm. yeah. And which is why I'm still a Baha'i today. Yeah. And I, I too, I, I, I'd like to acknowledge you here, Huti, and, and the other Māori Baha'i friends throughout the country who still carry the flag for us, even though I've pulled away to focus on, on um, helping our, our people um, rediscover their identity. Just knowing that you are all there carrying the flag for us is a, is a huge blessing to me. Yeah. yeah, Te Wārahi, I was just wondering if you could give us a bit of a, um, you know, a bit of a kōrero about the name Hohoterongo, that's the name that you gave to us for this particular uh, session, and I know that it has great meaning, so yeah. have you got, you want to share some of your thoughts about that? Yeah, it's, it's, um, I, I found it an interesting concept um, that our people of the past actually used um, to re-establish peace amongst people who are at, at war with each other and, uh, or any form of conflict with each other. And uh, like, like the word um, alludes to is, um, is a process whereby um, the affected parties, and they say both parties are affected during strife, um, not just the, the victims of, of the other. 
but they're both affected. And our ancestors saw the importance of re-establishing peace between the two, two parties. And in that process, uh, marriage took place, uh, gifts were exchanged, and at the end of the process, both parties and all of those who were affected by it, uh, their mana had been restored. Mm. So I, I thought that, you know, that name was a, um, an appropriate name to use for this kaupapa. Because when we look at um, the disparity between of what happened after Te Haina Tango Te Tiriti o Waitangi, the signing of the treaty, the signing of the treaty uh, we, um, uh, we somehow ended on uh, the lower level of the scale. And the process of Hoho Te Rongo hasn't taken place yet. Right. And I, I feel that the processes, the processes that um, the faith is carrying out, you, the work you're doing within the faith, the work that other people, even out of the faith, are working at, if they're working about creating that unity amongst, mm -hmm. the, amongst the communities, then they're working towards that process of Hoho Te Rongo. Right. Um, uh, it's a different matter when we're looking at uh, the powers that be taking the concept on board. Because uh, I think there's benefit in seeing um, um, disunity amongst the subjects <laughs> sure. in order to rule <laughs> peacefully. So that concept of ho te rongo in, and re-establishing the mana of every affected person right. is, is, is vitally important, I think. And yeah. I, I guess that, that really speaks to the underlying principle of the faith which is about unity. So unity, that's right. te rongo, making mm. peace, yeah. bringing about unity. Yeah. Thank you for that. Mm. Kia ora. <laughs> Beautiful ingoa. Nga mihi. O te wārahi, I understand you were one of the original claimants for the Y262 claim. Um, this was a vast report that considered modern perspectives on who's entitled to make or participate in decisions affecting indigenous flora and fauna in Aotearoa. I think this includes the environment, Māori culture and the products of Māori culture as well. And so it's quite a significant uh, claim and it's known as the mother of all claims and, and with you being an original member of the claimant group, uh, I just wondered if you wanted to share something of the journey of the Y262 with us. Kia ora. Cool. It was, you know, mid seventies, eh? When when the, the Waitangi Tribunal, Kopapa came into existence, and I think Janet will we can talk about the aspects of that because we never had a, a legal entity for us to take our our nowhere eh? to, and so of course. Uh, the Waitangi Tree Tribunal was created to do exactly that. Um, and it started started with the far north end because um, Maturata had a big role to play in the establishment of uh, uh, the tribunal. And um, so not long after that, when you, when, when you look at the, you know, Y262, Y it's 262 second, 266 second claim that gone before the tribunal. And we like that number because it starts off with Wai, which is short for, for uh, Waitangi. And uh, Wai, and then the 262, but we say Wairua. Oh, oh, choice, eh? <laughs> Wairua Onorua. <laughs> Um, as they claim. So that's when the Y262 um, claim came into existence. This is existence about that period. And the claimant, there were claimant finders throughout. Um, uh, There's only six claimants, starting from uh, Ngati Kuri in the far north, Te Rarawa, Ngati Wai, uh, and we jumped south to, I think, uh, Ngati Poro. 
uh, Ngati Kota in the top part of the South Island. There's one missing. A missing one. Six. Was there six? No, there wasn't six. No, no, she wasn't on the, uh -huh. uh, the claims then. So, um, and for Ngati Wai, uh, the chairman of the board took the claim out for us, but he never gave evidence. He called on the experts within the tribe to give evidence, and I was, I was one of those. Although I was still very young, then I was one of the, the ones who, who was called on to give evidence, along with our Komatua of that time. And out of all of the people that gave evidence throughout the country, there's only two of us left, Hori Prata and myself. Yeah. So that's how long ago this, uh, uh, this claim was put forward. And we do call it the Kreme Onga Kreme, in other words, the mother of all claims. Uh, <coughs> And um, there's several um, reasons why it, it kicked off. Uh, and one of those um, uh, reasons was around uh, the period when um, Del Wihongi, who led the charge, uh, I think they were in Christchurch when they found out about these uh, kumara that was taken from New Zealand to Japan to study. It's a scientific Thing. She found out about that and said, and this happened quite a few years ago. So she she uh, decided to head over to Japan and reclaim these kumara and bring them back to Aotearoa. And that was at the core of, of, of um, getting Y262 kicked off. Another reason was that we got wind of those, um, what do you call those, um, those Super organizations do with health, corporates. Yeah. Uh, we got wind of, of um, them, and that was through that GATT agreement that government signed, allowing um, foreign organizations to come in, like pharmaceuticals, people to come in, uh, take our, our rongoa from the forest, take it back overseas, study it, identify all of the healing um, elements of that plant and then register it, preventing us from using that plant, from going back to use that plant. So we got wind of that and said, ah, no way, this is going to the tribunal. And that, that was the beginning of it. So that claim covers every aspect of our flora and fauna, our wahitapu, the arts, Everything you can think of that's connected to the environment is covered by this claim. And um, a part of my presentation was the importance of our Mataranga Tukuiho and how that needs to be. I, 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 I naively stated that uh, Maori need to create a national body just to. Uh, manage the dissemination of this matauranga. That's what I thought. Well, 30 years later, I think we're only just now getting around to that concept. Yeah. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. that's yeah. That's that's about the journey of of Y262. Yeah. What a massive journey. Yeah. There are many uh, organisations today that are now learning how to engage with Māori in an authentic manner so that they ensure that you know, they don't overstep any of those principles that were um, laid out in Māori. Yeah. So and it's that's, really yeah. amazing to see the, you know, today where we yeah. are now and the work that was done many years ago yeah. to protect uh, the intellectual property. Māori, yeah. and uh, that's the contemporary perspective now on our uh, flora, fauna yeah. and cultural products, so yeah, thank you very much yeah. for that. So when you look at, yeah, so when you, oh, sorry, so when you look at um, our, our, our identity as Māori being closely linked to that, to that environment, to the flora and fauna, but we, of course, during that process, took it back to the atua. So that you can see how closely linked we were 
to your environment, tapping into tangaroa, tapping into uh, tane, tapping into tumato, tapping into tawhiri matea. They covered all of their land. So that was at the basis of our, our, our claim. And even the structures that we had in place to manage that, I think is what we're looking at now, re-establishing. So that uh, that information, that mataranga that comes out, isn't taken out of context willy-nilly by, even, even by our own people. We know at the, the last webinar that we had was based in Auckland, um, this young, young woman who'd um, gone into um, um, creating, um, well, they've got a honey, honey uh, business over on the island, and they also uh, design fabric materials and stuff like that. And they were, um, and they, because they're Maori, they wanted to tap into designs and stuff that they, um, they wanted to use to brand their product. And they became acutely aware of this Y262 theme and whether what they were doing was in line with uh, um, those, those, um, that copa that came out with the Y262 um, hearings. So they themselves had to, had to do a bit of a research in regards to whether they should be using that pattern or where did that pattern come from? Are we going to insult somebody by using that pattern? Yeah. So all of those sort of things that we have to come into, um, our people need to be re-taught re so that they can feel confident mm. in using uh, the patterns or, or even coming up with patterns that they could use. That's right, because there mm. are some patterns that are unique to various iwi. Iwi, and up, and whana. And whana. And whana, yes. come down to the whana. Mm. Hence the reason why, you know, um, why Whakaputanga was so important to us here in the north and why we still haven't settled in a lot of cases is because the iwi organizations that exist today didn't exist then. The signing of Te Tiriti was between hapu and the system. Eh? So the, the hapu, and this, this is pretty much um, not realized by a lot of people throughout the country, that hapu held the mana of our, because the hapu represented the extended whana. Eh? And that the core of the hapu was families. Yeah. And um, so when you went into to Totoko, your statement that, um, you know, yeah, you know it, comes, it goes back to iwi and hapu, at the core of it is the families that hold the mana. Those, those queer that held the, the knowledge of healing yeah, were from, from families of hapu. And they were recognized by the extended hapu as holders of that knowledge. Yeah. So now you're moving into a place where uh, the protection of that our Matauranga Māori, our indigenous knowledge, um, you're, you're talking, you were talking about um, people like yourself coming together to talk about how that can be protected for future generations yeah. and not be taken out of context and yeah. used willy-nilly. So you're, you're moving into that space now, yeah. I understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's vitally important that we head in that direction because in doing that, we are identifying, we are establishing our pro, uh, progressive, what was it? Succession. Oh, our succession plan for the future. Oh, yes. And that succession plan involves our taiohi, our taitamariki, taitamatane, in your area, rangatahi. Yeah. Um, it prepares them and teaches them how to manage that down and in turn they pass it on to the next generation. Hey. I think yeah. if I could just jump in there. Um, this has been a global movement as well, that we have led the way a lot as um, iwi Māori. We're leading the way for other indigenous peoples around the world to do the same. Because we have te tiriti, and some of them don't, and you, you would have more experience of this than I, in terms of the, uh, the Americans and um, the Hawaiians, um, our brothers and sisters in, in Australia, that are all just starting this process. You know, we are a long way down the track in many ways. Mm. That it is for the future generations, but it's also, to me, it embodies all of the of the Baha'i principles of the equality of men and women. Those queer that you're talking about who hold the knowledge, yeah. they have to be recognised as those knowledge holders and not just, you know, the, the men that sit at the table. Yeah. 
having knowledge because they don't. Yeah. And it's interesting. Yeah, I the rights of the children to that knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's all embodied in that, those principles. Mm. And just last year, the United Nations Secretary General, Anthony Guterres, he talked about indigenous knowledge, how it had been distilled over millennia, mm. and that it was now time to heed the voices of indigenous people mm. to reward mm. their knowledge. And he said that really through drawing on that knowledge of the connection with landscapes mm. and with the environment is vitally important to addressing the current climate crisis, which I think Absolutely. Is, you know, I can hear that in all of the discussion that mm. you're, you're talking about today. And we've been fortunate um, to be placed where we are right today in that um, w we've been able to um, be part of conversations with scientists and people who hold the power to make change on the climate, global climate crisis and things like that, in terms of our, our network with um, working with the, the uh, land care research in Niwa um, on, on their project with Antarctica, for instance, mm. which is about, it was a message, clear message to the leaders of the world to listen to that indigenous knowledge that we actually do know how to protect the environment. Um, We've been able to do that at, at that level, which has has been pretty amazing over the last couple of years, um, and that's ongoing. It's it's not finished yet. Just as humble, you know, indigenous people. Contributing. Yeah. Mm. It's having that voice and allowing it to be heard. That's right. Thank you. Kia ora. Any final comments about Y two six two? Watch the space. Yes, I watch here. Yeah, I think it's watch mm. watch the space because you know it's it's taken this long, over thirty years, for the government, a, a government, to even pick it up, and to to begin to address it. It's taken that. It's that big that they didn't know how to deal with. It. Mm. I'm, I'm bravely saying this, because yes. that's what it looks like to me personally. It was so big that it was it was difficult for them to see where to start or how to start. So, e mihi, mihi poto tēnei kun, kia hoi e nanaia. Because she's the one that picked it up and said, hey, let's do something. So, so when we say look at the space, we don't know how it's going to turn out because, uh, as you know, once once a project starts, it's it's heavily guided by the wairua as well. And, uh, yeah, and wairua has a, has a way of uh, uh, finding the solution that may not may not fit your idea of what the solution is. God's will. <laughs> it's God's will. But it's yeah. interesting the way that it ha is um, unfolding now, that it is um, the third generation from the original claimants. We've got the Mokropuna, yeah. who are all smart, university educated, oh, you know, yeah. articulate drivers, yes. who can then, will be able to take it to the next level and be heard, make it be heard, yes. and written and seen and tested and all of those things. So. We'll see how they get on. Yes, let's see how they get on. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Kia ora. Kia ora, Janet. Tēnā koe. Kia ora. I'm, um, I'm wondering if you could introduce yourself a little bit, tell us a little bit about yourself, and then maybe share some thoughts and some, uh, some, uh, some of the journey that you've had in the development of the Ikehioa Centre, because I know that you've been involved also along with Te Warihi, and uh, you've all you've been together on this journey every step mm. of the way, and so yeah, I'll just keep the floor to you. Kia ora. Yeah, well, um, I'm a child of Ngaitahu. Like um, most New Zealanders, I'm a licorice all sort. Um, I have Jewish grandmother, I have um, Scottish grandparents, um, Maori grandparents, and. Um, I've lived most of my life here in Taitokero. I came north here as a, a young journalist from Christchurch, Dunedin, where I was born. And so it's been a, an amazing journey of, of um, Taitokero coming out of obscurity as well as, um, as well as us as a people, I guess. Um, so the Hihawa Cultural Centre was born out of community uh, desire of, of our queer kaumatua here and some of the civic leaders who all wanted a, a cultural centre, Māori presence here on this 
Peninsula and in, way back in the 1990s um, Te Warahi and Chris both did a, a, a millennial project to build the Walker and Wave statue here and people at that time at the launching of that which wasn't until about 2003 said well where's the real Waka? So we got this idea that we, we needed to see real live Waka culture back alive in Whangarei. There was no, nothing in this town, city, that said any Māori lived here actually at that time. So this building happened to be redundant, uh, was owned by the city council, district council, and was given to Te Warahi to use for carving shed. So that happened and over those uh, intervening years we um, formed a trust and raised some money. It took us a long, long time to raise enough money um, and to open this as the Hihiawa Cultural Centre just uh, at Matariki 2019. Um, before that we had been approached um, around the Tuia 250 kaupapa and we decided that rather than um, a small flotilla of waka accompanying the endeavour and having a civic reception with the mayor that we needed to give them a proper haka pōwhiri into this they needed to come traditionally as they would have down the river and we planned to have a haka pōwhiri here when we didn't even have a building we thought no we can do that so that was a collaborative project with the city and all of the other institutions that were involved in that whole kaupapa which was a tier one national event and we pulled it off here. We had hundreds of people uh, on the screen space. On that day, we wolf welcomed people from all around the world. We included our Pacific Island community, who were the first to welcome them uh, down off the jetty, and then the full big haka pōwhiri. We fed 500 people that day on this deck uh, next door and inside the centre. And that was our springboard, really. It was our first really, really big event here. And since that time, the centre has become um, really a hub for Taitokoro community, for other tourism type uh, and, and cultural tourism projects around the north. And our, our principles that we have based upon a manakitanga, that's looking after the people, whanaungatanga, the relationships, and the kotahitanga, which we all know is the unity creating unity and as we all know as Baha'is that's a completely ongoing process. Um, we have used our culture to do that. We have used, um, we've, we've got a, a phrase that we use as our tagline which is reclaim, which is to reclaim those things that are precious of ours, our culture, which includes our identity, to restore those things of value that we have lost and then to renew them um, if they need renewal. And that's been a, a really uh, cool focal point for us moving forward to ensure that we sieve out what's important, let the cream rise to the top um, and move us forward. And uh, we think it has done uh, that for Whangarei, for Taitukero. But we have people here who come here on a daily basis from all around the world, all around the country, and everybody feels uh, at home, hopefully, because one of our other, other things is to, in the manakitanga is to make sure everybody feels welcomed. So what happens here are events, hui, wānanga, dinners, launches of products, or um, training, workshops, Exhibitions. Exhibitions as well. <laughs> um, art is created here, uh, relationships are created here, memories are created here. Beautiful. Everything is um, spiritually based. It, um, the Chinese would say that it's the feng shui because we're between two rivers we, and we have the maunga behind us, you know, it's, it's the vibe is right. Um, we felt the time was right. We have spent um, the first 25 years of our Baha'i life um, dedicated to the administrative order and as a journalist I worked for 10 years on Herald of the South as an editor which was a, an amazing experience as well. We've both worked on local assemblies, Te he was on National Assembly for 
um, five years or so, an auxiliary board member for 10 years probably. And um, we get old and tired doing that, but this has been a rejuvenating kind of project for us. We were still working obviously in our government jobs as well while we were building this up as volunteers. And now that we're officially retired, we can really just enjoy enjoy it here now and be um, continually thinking of new and exciting things. One of the legacy projects that's come out of the Tuia 250 Kaupapa is um, a beautiful exhibition we did on, um, on the day of the Haka Pōwhiri. We got a cross-section of our community together and we, they were photographed by a friend of ours, Diane Stoppard, who's a wonderful f professional photographer. And we ask the questions like you're doing here today, what does this mean for you? What is this dual heritage shared future that we're talking about? And we captured all of that for Karo, all of the cordero and of the images. Mm -hmm. And the following year we had an exhibition of the work and very soon we're going to launch the book of that whole process. And we have some essays in that book, we have the portraiture we have the, the thoughts of the portrait subjects and it's uh, really um, was done in the pre-COVID era, the yes. most of the, the, the mahi and the words and it's very refreshing now to look back on it and see that people's uh, vision for the future. It's called Me Anga Whakamua, Facing the Future and it's about the unity and diversity. It's the same thread right through, it's everybody saying well here we are, we are Māori, we have this history, it's, it's pretty hairy, our stories can be told now, we can accept the past, we can unpick it and we can move forward together mm. and it's incredibly brave I think um, and we hope that it will be something that people will be able to refer to when it is launched and that will be around Waitangi Day next year that it will be inspiring for people to take some action in their communities, to express who they are, celebrate who they are, and, and teach others mm. who we are, mm. and how we think, and what's important. I, I, you, I was lucky enough for you to give me a preview of, the, of one of the books. And uh, you know, I just love the very positive um, perspectives that were expressed there. A lot of beautiful things expressed there that I wish we could share today, but there's far too many to share. But there's one particular sentence there that really jumped out at me, where um, I, I think it might have been you, you Te Warehi or, or you, Janet, who said, Māori and Pākehā loved each other. Mm. And I thought I'd never heard that expressed in such a way before, and of course they did. You know, you know, we're the products of that. Mm. But um, I, I loved the uh, concept of uh, the coming together of the two peoples and the two-year commemorations, and now you're continuing that legacy, mm. continuing to have that conversation about the dual heritage between Māori and Pākehā. And I and mm. I congratulate you for doing that because not many other people are doing it. But I wanted to mention that particular um, sentence because it means so much to all of us. Mm. And I think that's a, uh, we often hear a lot of the negative and the mm. hairy, mm. But, uh, but these are the positive things that we can take forward with us mm. when we're thinking about our dual shared heritage. Mm. Kia ora. Mm. And I guess too that um, we're at a stage in our development as a nation where we, we're trying to reach equity um, and, and a lot of people are a bit scared of that. We see it politically, we're having a Māori health authority for the first time. We've always, we, the, when we get these things we go, why hasn't that happened before? Mm. And it's part of the equalising of, of, of the equilibrium, it's the that Bahá'u'lláh talked about, that, that that's our whole purpose, mm. is that is to bring about that justice. Um, that we've, I guess, um, we have to be mature enough as a society um, to accept. And, and, and this is the wonderful thing that we sense and see here on a daily basis, is the awakening of other cultures 
to the beauty of our culture, mm. and I don't mean that in a superficial sense. Yes, our waiata are beautiful, our women are beautiful, our children are beautiful, our, our, our waiata aringa are beautiful. I'm not talking about those aspects. I'm talking about our ways of being mm -hmm. and thinking and being with each other. Okay. Um, and, and be able to appreciate that and that we are not like, we are unique. We are not like everyone else and we don't want to be. We're not homogenous. Yes. We are all individual, we do it, all individual souls, but yes, we, we have, our culture is what actually is the, um, expresses who it's we the, are. Yes, it's, it's our way of being, being in the world. Being, doing and knowing and thinking. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for yeah. that. And I think that's a lovely uh, segue into um, our next discussion that yes. we're going to have with your beautiful mokopuna. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I recall that verse, the very first verse in the hidden words, the best beloved of all things, all things. in my sight is, is justice. justice, which is why she was named. Yes, I had no doubt. <laughs> Deprive that. thyself not therefrom. Kia ora. Mm -hmm. Kia justice. Kia ora and welcome. Thank you for mm. joining us this afternoon. Justice, um, you know, I've been talking to both of your beautiful grandparents here, Te Warihi and Janet, and uh, about something to, of the Māori historical and contemporary perspectives and the impacts of colonisation on our people, just from your own particular lens. And I wondered if you wanted to introduce yourself a little bit, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. Uh, we know who you are, <laughs> <laughs> but it'd be nice to hear uh, a little bit more. And of course, all of the impactful work that I've heard that you've been doing among uh, your own peers and of mm. course uh, uh, work that's advancing the best interest of Māori and of course around the history in Aotearoa that you're mm. uh, trying to um, hopefully uh, in increase the amount of history that's being taught in schools mm. around Aotearoa. Mm. So can you share some of that with us mm. and yeah, we'd love to hear from you. Um, yeah, kia ora, thanks for having me. It's a real privilege to be here and um, yeah, share the space with you. And with my whanau. Um, yeah, I don't really know where to start really, it's, there's a lot. Um, so what about yourself perhaps to start off with yeah. and the mahi you've been doing? Um, I grew up here in Whangarei with my whanau. Um, yeah, i raro i te aroha o, um, yeah, my, my whanau, my grandparents, my mum, um, my sisters, um, went to Girls High here, I uh, had a really good experience there, um, you know, did a little bit of mahi, eh? I suppose with them, um, I'm still working with them at the moment to um, help encourage um, the staff and the students to embrace our Māori um, and make it a more embracing space for our Māori students as well. Mm. Because um, when I was year 13, I was the last one left, the last, I think there were maybe two Māori prefects out of 46 or something. Um, and so in our final year, we, my, my um, Māori class and I wrote a karakia, or a, at least a non-religious karakia, we have more of an affirmation, I suppose. Um, and yeah, that was a way for us as a school to acknowledge Te Ao Māori, to acknowledge our culture and hopefully make the space a little bit more welcoming and um, filled with a bit more aroha for our Māori, our Māori girls and in hopes that they would stay and that they would feel loved and appreciated and seen um, in the education, in, in their education. Um, but it turned more into something that enriched everyone's cultural understanding. Um, yeah, and it's a bit of a tanga for everyone who goes to that school. So that was an awesome journey in itself. Um, then I went off to university. I've just finished my law and arts degree, um, five years, but I did most of my study from here, from home. Um, so I could stay close to my whanau, so I could stay close to my community and be involved. Um, Auckland wasn't the space for me really and it was hard for me to find community there. So many people, but you know, it can get a bit lonely in that place. 
Um, yeah, and so I met um, three really close friends of mine now. I met them in Auckland. Um, Reeve Gray, Kate McLeod, whose um, mum is Diane Stoppard, who um, I heard Toa talk about before. Um, and Rowan Hemara. And together we created Ha, History of Aotearoa. Um, That's what Ha means, History of Aotearoa. Yeah, Kiora. yeah. And Ha also being um, the breath of life, which is what we feel our learning our history gives us that enlightenment, that breath of life that reinvigorates us and steers us in the right direction. Um, and you know, at university, it's all it's all exciting, and you're learning about the world and all of the woes of our society. Um, and I think we all just got to we we got to a stage where we were sick of just talking about it. Um, and we felt we needed to do something and the very core and foundation of our kaupapa is aroha um, probably comes from being raised with these two as well which is um, really special um, and so we thought how can we do something about this with aroha how can we fill this the lives of others with aroha because our history is such a shocking and confronting um take it's personal yes. you know um and so we thought the best way to do that is through education is through the learning and to do so in a safe way and um we found that the use of art was just the most beautiful tool to carry that history yes that's quite heavy it allows us to express the mamai, um, to express the complexity of our history, because there's always many, there are many versions, um, and we acknowledge that as well, is that there's not just one history, you know, we all have different perspectives, Sure. and so, we, you know, the history that comes through us is, comes from a myriad of perspectives as well, um, and yeah, so art gives us just this amazing platform to be able to share that history, for those learning to express their emotions, um, to express how they feel about that history. And so we started with our year 10s. Um, we just thought that was a beautiful age, um, still learning about the world, um, can find their own truths um, as well at that stage, I feel. And um, we also identified that in school, we don't learn our history. We learn about everyone else's history, That's but right. we're det extremely detached from our own. Um, and so we thought, let's start with our, the next generation, the next ones coming through. Um, that's been an amazing journey. We started in 2019 as well, yes. same time as the two-year kaupapa was happening. Um, we started at Whangarei Girls High, obviously a really good relationship with them. Um, they're like whānau um, now, which is really special. Um, and then last year we had a little bit of a break with COVID. Um, and towards the end of 2020, we wanted to get started again. We felt the momentum coming and um, we organised a fundraising exhibition. So artists from here, our local artists, national artists, donated their mahi for an exhibition to fundraise for our kaupapa. Um, yeah, it was Fantastic. really special and to see the amount of people, artists, our community who felt the need as well for that kind of education, that felt the importance of connecting with who we are, with connecting to our whenua, to developing that sense of identity that has been quite systemically deprived from us yes. through the education system. Yes. Um, and we raised a whole lot of funds so that we could deliver our program and develop it further this year, which has been just awesome. And so we've worked with Pompali Catholic College um, with the Year 10s, and we have just developed our first teachers program, wow. Kahikatea. Yeah, so 
with the rollout of the history um, in the education system next year, we identified that it's a little bit unfair that our teachers are expected to teach our history without having safely engaged themselves yes. in that history. Um, it's not just another history topic. That's right. um, it is personal, it is confronting, and our worry was that if our teachers don't safely engage in that history, then it creates hostile environments in our classroom for our ta tamariki. Right. Um, and we, at our fundraising exhibition, we had um, the ministers and Jacinda come um, and we told them about our kaupapa. They made some art to donate to the exhibition as well, which wow. was really special. Um, and that was the first time that they had ever heard any, not um, disagreement to the rolling out of the history in school, but any type of um, questioning of the process right. of rolling it out. Right. That was the first time they had ever thought of our teachers, you know, that this actually is quite serious. Yes. Um, and so hopefully we can keep developing a bit of a partnership and um, make sure that us, our teachers are given a fair shot because they want to do it right. Yes. They don't want to go out there and create dangerous situations for our kids. They, they're looking for help, they don't know where to find it. And so we created our, our teachers program um, to help them go through our history and especially our local history, that's what's really important to us, the whenua that we are on. Um, in relation to the wider kind of um, the general national history as well, mm -hmm. but um, yes, I wondered about that because mm -hmm. um, you know, do you see Ha rolling out its kopapa across the nation? I know that in our area as well, during mm -hmm. those the last two years, has mm -hmm. been a quite a topic for conversation mm -hmm. about learning the Maori history and local history within mm -hmm. the within the schools of our area. So, mm -hmm. do you see Ha? Um, having an influence or impacting that across other yeah. areas. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that has always been at the front of our minds any, since the very beginning. Right. We saw the need everywhere for yes. that. Um, yeah. But the most important thing for us is that it's built by the community. Yes. That is our number one. That it's mm. built. The, the history we teach, the content comes from our kaumatua, it comes from academics that we trust, um, it comes from our community and all of our programs are developed by the students, uh, developed by the teachers who participate um, in our programs, and we do that to make sure it actually fits yeah. for them. It's for right. them, and so right. we, we don't want to be making something and thinking it's right for them if it's not, and right. so we listen to what our community need. Um, and so we are hoping to develop the framework that can then be taken into different villages, you know, yes. the different towns, the different um, communities, and for them to take it, and for them to be the facilitators and the content creators, and have a framework for them to use, um, to do that for their own people, and right. we see that that's, yeah, the most important thing. I can't go anywhere else and say how they should exactly. do it. <laughs> right. according to our yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's emerging from the grassroots, you, but you've yeah. got that, that framework for people to follow. Mm. Mm. Yes, yeah, so I see that you uh, are one of you feature in the book that's about to be published, Me Angapakamua, which is the legacy on from the two, two year commemorations. And I know that you had a bit of a role in some of that. And uh, I just wondered if you wanted to share some of your thoughts about Me Angapakamua and Tuya. And uh, I know that you've got some beautiful comments in there, and I wished that we could actually, you know, have your poem in this, uh, in this particular uh, interview. However, I, I also know that you said no. So, um, I but, but the wonderful thing is, uh, we can buy that book. <laughs> that will help, help to promote it. But anyway, have you got anything to share about that experience? Um, yeah, I think I, I have inherited such um, a significant responsibility to continue what has come before me. I feel that I'm a bit of a bridge between the past and our future. Um, and I move in that way, informed by that. I think understanding of, of who I am 
is a bridge between our history and our and our future. They're one and the same, really. But I think that um, it's really important for us to be thinking forward, thinking of our mokopuna to come. Um, yeah, and how we relate to each other and how we reconnect to each other as well. Because um, our, our history has been divisive, I feel. And um, yeah, it's time that we make justice of the things that have happened. And I think we can only do that if we understand where we've come from. Yes. And if we understand who we are in relation to this whenua, everyone, not just as tangata whenua, um, as tauiwi, as Pākehā, what does it mean to be Pākehā? Um, what does it mean to be both? Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm really hopeful. I think, I think that we're at a really exciting junction of time where we become, we're awakening to our past. Yep. We're awakening, awakening um, to who we are so that we can move in the direction we need to be. And so I feel really hopeful about um, the movement. There's a real collective shift, ha shift happening, I feel, and um, it's exciting. I'm excited. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I, I recall there is a whakatauki, and uh, just in English, though, we walk into the past, and this is a Māori whakatauki, we walk mm. into the future looking backwards. Mm. And I think that really sums us up as a people. Mm. Um, no matter what, we're always looking back. We're always talking about the history. We're always trying to draw in mm. our intergenerational experiences and and our tipuna who mm. are in the next world. We talk of all the time. And so mm. um, understanding that you're in one part of the continuum and mm -hmm. that you have that responsibility. And I think right at the beginning of this interview, we talked about um, koto e kawiatea e kawea tonutia na ohaki o mato tipuna mm. and that is what we do mm. as Māori we carry forward that legacy from our ancestors mm. and it's something that just that just is mm. and uh, so I appreciate what you've just said and yeah you are, the, are a bridge <laughs> and I know that your grandparents your beautiful grandparents have a lot of high hopes for you and, and all of your siblings and your, your whānau so Kia ora, thank you for that. Thanks for taking the time. Oh, no, I know that you um, recently lost your grandmother. So, um, yeah, thanks for coming and, and sharing those with us. Kia ora. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there any closing comments you'd like to make? Because, you know, the Baha'i community are here. They, they are they're visiting with you. <laughs> and so is there anything you'd like to say before we close? I was, when you first made that com comment, I was... Uh, quite happy to leave uh, the comments in the hands of our future. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But to to the Baha'i community out there, I feel honoured to be here. To feel, yeah, I feel very honoured to be here actually, and uh, and again to thank you for uh, for approaching us mm. to do this program. Um, I was saying to Justice earlier, before you, you came up, I said, you know, um, I'm sensing really strong that we need to reconnect with the faith. Uh, I never stopped to think how, because when I, when I start thinking about how, all I think of how busy I was. <laughs> and I thought, oh, maybe I don't really like it. Uh, but now that I'm over 70, I guess I can say that. Um, um, uh, I can quite safely make a reconnection without being um, swamped <laughs> uh, with the aroha <laughs> of the community. So, kia koutou katoa. What do we call a summer school? Yes, kura raumati. Kura raumati. Enjoy this year's experience. Because uh, it's been a, a real interesting um, uh, last few years with uh, that uh, COVID fella hanging around our door. And uh, um, 
It's like, uh, you know, the waka and wave kupa we were talking about down here. The waka symbolised our, our uh, represented our culture, and the wave symbolised the colonization of our, our colonisation of our culture. This COVID is no different. It's a bit of a coloniser, but it's a colonised fellow we can get used to. <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, enjoy your summer school. Thank you, Wallace. Thank you, Wallace. Uh, Tewarihi, Janet, and Justice for joining us today. Kia ora, mm -hmm.